Hi, I'm Michael Killen. In this show, you will have an opportunity to gain insights into the GOP's climate change strategy. Yes, the Republican Party's climate change strategy. George Schultz, working at the Hoover Institute at Stanford, has been working for several years developing recommendations for the new Congress and the new president with respect to how we should address climate change and the national energy policy. He has teamed up with Jim Baker, Paulson, and several other senior <coughs> persons to make this recommendation to the rest of the GOP. I have invited Rapu Malahatra, he is an SRI fellow. He is also credited with developing a symbolic way of thinking about national energy issues in a different environment, a mathematical model environment, and to bring the topic back, the data back. I've invited him to help me discuss George Schultz's climate change strategy for the GOP. First of all, Rapu. Thank you, uh, Michael. Um, by the way, I tend to feel lucky to have you as a friend and a colleague. Uh, you are a, a good mate to have. You know, I deal with the art, the feelings, and you take care of all the numbers for me, which I think is wonderful. So behind me, ladies and gentlemen, is a painting that I made. It's 15 feet by 6 foot. What it is is my interpretation, with the help of Rapu, of George Schultz's recommendations for the Congress and for our president. And this painting will debut on June 23rd at the Silicon Valley Energy Summit at Stanford University. So, Rapu. Hi, Michael. Uh, Tell me, you of course know George Schultz. I do. And you told me the other day that a year or so ago, in front of an audience, maybe it was, he articulated his climate change strategy. Yes. What did you think of it? Well, it has a lot of merit. Yeah. And I think there are there were some things that he was saying very clearly, which I know that only a person who is not actively seeking in a, a, a congressional seat could say things because uh, tax was a big part in there. He was saying that the debate about this, it's, you know, climate change, it's a big risk. And if nothing else, then just for the sake of mitigating this risk, we need to take some actions. That was a starting point. He was not going to go into the debate of, how much the sea levels are going to rise or how much or whether it's true. I know he, he accepts that part. It's a basic fact that greenhouse effect is real. Globe, the world has been getting warmer. And that it's going to have consequences. And we don't know in which exactly how bad or how severe and where and all that. But just looking at the risks, both in terms of the national energy security and the, the devastation to the population or the effects to the population as overall, uh, it's worth taking actions. Okay. And you said he's made a suggestion or one element of his strategy is a tax. A tax on carbon yes. so that if you do that, you can then generate some revenues. And also, you know, what, what the tax does is it raises the cost and therefore provides incentive for the carbon-free sources of energy to compete a little better. And the question was, he doesn't want that carbon tax, that is revenue that's generated over there, uh, to be uh, used by the government. Because again, you, know, you don't want government to grow any bigger. At least if you're a Republican, you don't want that at all. He says, it should be given back to the people. So whatever you generate, you put it back to the people. So let me ask, is that really a tax? If I 
borrow money from you, and then I give it back to you. Have what have you done? Yeah. It's well, a wash. because because what it has done is in the meantime, the carbon sources of energy. So when I, as a user, go to buy my my energy, I would like to like to buy the things that is the most uh, cost effective, and the carbon intensive sources of energy are going to be more expensive in that scenario. Now we have to we have not decided as to how much the tax could be. Um, maybe his uh, articulation of the plan uh, may, may say that I don't recall that number what he was using, but I can say that uh, if you look at what carbon is really selling for in some many like the cap and trade markets here and in Europe and they're high and low and they bounce around, but around ten dollars a ton. Ten dollars a ton. That would be a tax. So, if I have a plant, I'm making steel or concrete, or maybe I'm making an electricity. Okay. And if uh, my team has made the measurements, which are often checked by mm -hmm. the government, and we're putting out thirty tons of carbon dioxide every day, mm -hmm. then your cost will go up by 30 times 10, those $300. Yeah, it doesn't seem like a lot of money. No, not uh, a whole lot. But 100 tons, I, don't, I think you're going to be putting out a lot more tons. Uh, uh, a lot <laughs> more. I think you know, most of the companies, um, yeah. I and mean, it, it ones in the energy sector, it, we, are t we are talking five so and a half billion tons of CO2 emitted in the US every year. Five and a half billion tons, if I use ten dollars a ton again so the potential to generate fifty five billion fifty five billion on the u.s. treasury is not a lot of money it's not a very large sum of money so maybe we will want to tax at twenty dollars or thirty dollars yeah. i don't know that's to be the uh, okay. i just wanted to give you a hundred but if we went that way so we have generated fifty five billion it's nothing to sneeze at and let's say you as uh, george uh, secretary schultz has uh, proposed that this money be distributed back to the people so that helps them offset their energy costs because we don't want to aggravate you know energy is very important for everybody's living and so it, they will get a rebate I like about hundred and seventy five dollars per person per year and if the government sets a higher tax rate on the carbon then the, uh, the, we would the rebate get, would be higher. We could get 5,000. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> Depends on what level you want to use the tax at, right? Okay, so I'd like to paraphrase you for a minute. If I run a company and my company is emitting a considerable amount of carbon and I find now I have to pay a tax on it, so the method I'm using to manufacture or do whatever I'm doing now is a little less competitive to maybe some other approach. Correct. So I would start thinking about how I can get the work done, get the energy I need without using sources of fuel that are polluting. Or use less, increase your efficiency. Oh, oh yes, uh, efficiency. Efficiency improvements got, get a big boost in this. Yeah. So as a manufacturer, you would like to use all the efficiency measures that are available to you and bring down your emission cost and therefore the cost of your goods that, and services that you are providing you, so that you can be more competitive in the market. So that's a very strong driving force. Yes. So a tax will really help American companies become stronger because, you know, we think when we have to think, we find solutions that usually make us a lot stronger. You mentioned, and this is a tangent, energy efficiency. And I think it was you uh, thought you heard that the, uh, the Trump administration wants to do away with supporting Energy Star program, which is a program I use. Uh, I'm not exactly concerned with pennies and quarters, and <laughs> but I buy a new refrigerator, buy a new washer, dryer. I'm always buying 
the energy star because I value reducing my energy costs and I especially value not putting out more emissions mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. the atmosphere than I have to, or whatever. Right. Is <clears> that true, that the administration is backing away from where that's, we still... That's what I heard. That was a little news item, a clip that I happened to hear. I haven't seen it in print or anything, but I did hear that as I was driving. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and then I, I want to share... Um, and like you, I get to talk to a lot of people, policymakers in some cases, uh, mm -hmm. like uh, uh, Dave uh, Jones, who is the California Energy Commissioner. I, I was talking to him the other day, and he said to me something I found interesting. He has told all the insurance companies in the state of California, if you are investing in coal stock, stocks that mm -hmm. are based on uh, the excavation and the processing of coal. coal. He wants them to divest. Divest because he envisions the climate change, sea level rise, hurricanes, droughts, and things. Uh, changing weather patterns are going to be more violent, severe, and frequent. And that could place great demands on the insurance companies to pay for the damages. And with the coal stocks and maybe some other fossil fuel stocks going down, it threatens the uh, ability of the insurance companies to pay up. Is that something that you've come across? Uh, no, I have uh, not. I have not. Okay, okay. I know that it, there are, it's a drive to do that, but I thought you were going to take it in a different direction because on the one hand, we are trying to resurrect the coal jobs, mm. increase the, because that's the big source of energy in the U.S. is the fossil energy sector. And the new administration would really like to increase because once we have energy, which is the ultimate commodity, that, yeah. that really helps yeah. build a stronger industry. But at the same time, it really threatens through climate change yeah. our own energy security, stability, and a lot of other factors. And if the hurricanes are getting more intense and the insurance companies cannot insure, then it's, it's a, <laughs> it's a double-edged sword. Okay. Now, you talked about some numbers about uh, the price of a ton of carbon, okay, billions of carbon, uh, billions of tons. But you were just in St. Louis, I think. Yes. And the floods yes. hit that city. And I think they're still hitting that city. Yes. I, I was in, no that, in the town of Eureka, yeah. where my daughter lives. And I've, I'm seeing the pictures of that. And I saw the, 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 the inn that, we, you know, the, the hotel that we were staying at, not far from there at an intersection of two major freeways, uh, US 44 and 141, and it's the, they're all underwater. Yeah. So, um, and you do the numbers better than me, the collection of attacks compared to a major, major storm. Uh, couldn't we have storms that are 500 <laughs> million billion? Dollars, uh, well, yeah. they can be in the several billion dollars very yeah. easily, yeah. and tens of billions of dollars. Yes. Okay. How much was Sandy? I forget. Well, a I lot of money. A lot of money. I think it was about twenty billion. Yeah. I, I'm not sure, but I, some, which was a large number. Yeah. Yeah. And I, the frequency is, I mean, I keep hearing uh, from people in St. Louis, mm. people who, uh, you know, kind of were. Uh, not necessarily believers in uh, yeah. climate change and all that, but they are seeing, wait a minute, five years ago or three years ago, we had this once in a century or once in a decade yeah. storm, and here it is again, here it yeah. is again. Yeah. I was wondering, can we get up for a minute and go by the painting? Sure. And, <clears throat> sure. and so I have the task of interpreting George Schultz's GOP. Yeah. Uh, plan strategy on canvas 
And I, I do want to acknowledge I have bounced every idea off of you. And it seems to me we're all concerned about this greenhouse gas monster. Yeah. And how big is it? So the CO2 that's in the air at the moment is 3.2 trillion. Trillion. Trillion with a T. Tons. Tons. A trillion ton. tons of CO2. Carbon dioxide. I, I'm, there's another way of representing this with, when people talk about these global concentrations is in tons of carbon. But that's taking just the weight of carbon in carbon dioxide. And there's a factor of 3.7 lurking in there, causes confusion. Uh, in our discussion, let's stick with the weight of CO2. CO2. So 3.2 trillion tons, or if I'm going to be using billion tons, which I call GT that I have annotated here, that's gigatons, metric tons. Okay. So 3,200 gigatons okay. of CO2 is already there in the air. How much are we feeding it? We are feeding it, by energy, from energy use, we are feeding it about 35 billion tons. Okay. So it's about 1% of them. Okay. And the people who have really studied, the scientists, government officials, and businesses, and they have come to the conclusion a long time ago, this is already too big of a monster. I mean, it's really going to hurt us. And we don't want to feed it anymore. So my thinking, George's tax is the creation of a wall, not the wall between Mexico and the United States, which will never be built. Uh, it is a symbolic Barrier. particular uh, articulation. And this wall makes it difficult for companies, all types of companies that are excavating oil, gas, coal, to get their products over this wall to the marketplace. Right. And when they do, they feed yeah. the monster. So here's a little oil, here's a little gas, here's some more gas. And yes, the use of gas is just booming, I believe. And some people even think gas is uh, yes. clean. You know, you wouldn't want to breathe the burning of that stuff. OK, it's quite dirty. and. And here's uh, somebody in one of those industries who's just exhausted and wiped out. And what George wants to see happen, he wants to see the White House and Congress to team up together mm -hmm. to agree to a tax on carbon. And California and about uh, six, seven other states around here, I think, and East. other countries. They already have a cap and trade tax and, and various other cap kinds. and trade is not a tax. So okay. can't use that word. That three letter word is a is okay. an anathema. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so George wants Congress to team up with the White House. And right now, you know, everybody says, you know, all the Democrats say uh, Trump is a denier of climate change and in the four years that are going to pass, you know, we're really going to go down in the hole. But, you know, Trump only says that. He, there is no such thing because he's appealing to his base. And actually today, he, he was at an event and he said, it's so hot in this room, I just may start believing in climate change. <laughs> the odds are Trump, because his base is going to realize he sold mm -hmm. them a bill of goods on a lot of things. It, Good, they'll probably get disenchanted. And when he, they get disenchanted, Trump will probably become a believer in climate change just to get some of the Democrats' vote. Now, um, over here, you mentioned energy efficiency. And the state of California and some other states, and even the United States, yeah, yes, had believes that we want to take all the oil that's we're going to use all the sun-based renewable energies, nuclear, maybe not California. And we want to feed them into this device. And this is the energy efficiency device. And when we, we 
use energy efficiency approaches and systems, out of it comes money. Money. Yeah. Companies save money. You <clears throat> save money in your house. I save money. Out of the other approach comes power. And power, for example, to create electricity. And this is a little. OK. George strategy is to throw a lifesaver to all the 98 or so nuclear power plants in the United States. You know, keep them safe. You keep getting energy out of them because the energy that comes out of it yeah. does not pollute. No. Not pollute. And it's a lot of energy that comes out of it. Oh, yeah. What percentage in the United States? 20%? Electricity. Yeah. Electricity. Yeah. 20% of our electricity comes from it? I don't know. Something like that, yeah. I, I could ask you a million questions. <laughs> you get most of them. Yeah, no, no. Electricity-wise, if you're just looking at the kilowatt hours or something, yes, about 20% number is a good one. It yeah. may have dropped a little bit, so I'm not 100% sure about that. Uh, haven't checked last year's numbers. Okay. So George wants to do what the Citizen Climate Lobby lobbying group is doing. They're lobbying for a, a tax on carbon. He wants a significant investment in energy efficiency, and he wants to protect the existing nuclear power plants right. until we're ready to move on to something yeah. else. Yeah, because maybe, like you know, there's, it makes no sense to turn a good, clean energy source off. Yeah. Because what are you going to do with it? What well, people are going to are going to demand that electricity? We have that need to run our homes and factories and everything, you know, we use lots of power. Yeah. And that energy is, has to come from somewhere. Yes. And if we turn this off, like Japan did, or like, I mean, Germany did, had to put up a whole bunch of other fossil fired uh, thing to compensate also. Yes. So yes, although they have gone down in CO2, they could have gone, they could have avoided a whole lot more, but for this. So okay. it, makes, it makes little sense to uh, just drive them off. All right. And so George has a second nuclear component to his recommendation, and that is a considerable investment in the next generation mm -hmm. of nuclear energy plants, which the scientists have been able now to design them so they can't blow up, yeah. they can't sprue radioactive, yeah. they can't make a lot of waste. Yeah. And I'll just start a description of how one of these plants works. I think they put a, a chemical called thorium, maybe some other chemicals, in here. And it's radioactive. It's, mm -hmm. And it heats up. And it's very hot. And it tends to heat water, which creates steam. And the steam makes turbines spin. Okay, So the thorium uh, circulates around like this. You know, it keeps circulating around and making steam. I haven't shown the process of making the steam. And it's fail safe. You don't have to worry about. Yeah, the thorium is dissolved in a molten salt. Molten salt, which can okay. be. Okay. And that salt, because it has a very high boiling point, it means it doesn't, it can go to high temperatures. 500. Yeah, without any vapor pressure. Yeah. So, you know, when you heat water up, when you try to cool a reactor with water, you will build up a lot of pressure. This okay. has no pressure build up. Okay. And if by some chance this gets really hot, what happens is they have a mechanism, it's symbolic now, the pipes get so hot down here that they melt and everything just pours out and the system shuts yeah. down. Yeah, they generally, they don't have the whole pipe working, but they have a deliberate yeah. plug in there so that that plug melts. Yeah. And now the liquid, the salt, salt that is molten in there and has dissolved your fuel, and when it's in that compact, that's when it is critical. But when it falls out, it spreads out, it is no longer yeah. critical yeah. because the, it is spread very thinly. And so the neutrons that are emitting are not breeding and they are not sure. carrying on the nuclear reaction anymore. So that's why it is fail safe. Okay. Walk away safe because work is done by gravity. Okay. We're running out of time now. And this I think of as the Social Security. And that's the Treasury. The tax money is collected by the Treasury. 
and then it's distributed out to the people, everyone who has a social security. Okay. Yeah. So um, this is my interpretation, mm -hmm. and, and I, I really appreciate all the help you always give me. This painting debuts again on June 23rd at Stanford's Silicon Valley Energy Summit, uh -huh. and I'm very pleased about that. And then I want to ask you, you have an event coming up. Yeah. What, uh, in Palo Alto? Yes. What is it? It's, I'm calling it this time, you know, I, the book was A Cubic Mile of Oil that we, my co-authors and I, we wrote. That was describing the energy situation as it exists. Now my talk is going to be focusing on replacing cubic miles of oil. And yes, oh. I'll be talking a lot about the thorium reactors as well as nuclear and trying to address yeah. concerns that people have. Yeah, I would say for anybody studying energy, sustainability, people in the governments, community governments, etc. this is a truly wonderful book to get not only the numbers but to new ways of thinking about uh, energy and the requirements. And If I may, uh, the, the event is on May 18th. May 18th. Thursday. That's at, at 5.30 or 6, 6 o'clock, yeah. 5.30. Check, this, check the website for Café Scientifique. Ca say that again, Café? Café Scientifique uh, in, Santa, in, in Silicon Valley. Okay. So it's at the HANA House. So HANA House website also has it. All right. And the event, they actually record and they live stream it on Facebook as right. well as uh, uh, post it online later. Okay. I'd like to make one more announcement. We are taping in a PEG TV station, public education, mm -hmm. uh, government TV station. There's about 3,000 of them in the United States. And uh, I'm pleased that about 30 of them right now can access this show. Great. Three different words, uh, Vimo and uh, PEG Media and Telview Connect. Any one of the 3,000 stations, just go on to one of these three television show exchange, take the show down. And for Pooh, good man, thank you. Thank you, Michael, for thank having me. Yes, I yeah. really enjoyed. And uh, so, Peg Media, Tell View Connect, or Vimo are three places where. TV stations around the country can gain access to shows like this one. Again, I'm Michael Killen. see you at the Silicon Valley Energy Summit 2017. That is where my new painting will be displayed. I am Michael Killen.